Good morning. All right, we'll see if we can get through this. So let's start with a scripture. Let's turn to one of my favorite books, Ecclesiastes. If you would turn to Ecclesiastes 1. And if you would, bear with me today. Brother Marcus, do you mind advancing one slide? There we go. So you're going to see this. And this is basically just some nice, pretty graphics. So in case you get tired of looking at me, you got something else to kind of keep your attention. I'm going to try something different. I'm going to try it without slides today. So get your Bibles ready. We're going to got some reading to do. So we'll give something, give this a shot. As you notice, I don't have my normal blue. I'm going to speak shirt on or a suit. So try this out. But anyway, Ecclesiastes 1, 9-10. Begin to verse 9. It reads, That which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which it may be said, See, this is new. It has already been in ancient times before us. There's nothing new under the sun. All been done. So if that's the case, then why does it feel like the world has shifted on us at times? Why does it feel that there's times we look around and say, well, that's new. That's never happened to me before. And God's really good. He makes things real simple. Turn to the next verse. Ecclesiastes 1.11. And if we keep reading there, Ecclesiastes 1.11, there is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of things that are to come by those who will come after. We forget. And it's not just that. What has happened has happened to others, but not necessarily to us, right? Now, it happens to others. Wow, that sure is new to me, right? That's, that's different. What do we do when that happens? When things are new to us, what do we do? How do we handle the changes that come in our lives? Today, I'm not your regularly scheduled speaker. You normally have Brother Mike, and he does a great job. And most of you are thinking, hey, what's going on with this guy? Well, I'm... Most of you are probably thinking, I'll bear with this guy for a week and Mike will be back next week, so I can deal with it. And I thank you for that, for humoring me. I appreciate it. So, but that's a simple change, right? Let's take the challenge up a bit. Let's move inside something just different. Let's take it up a notch or a few notches. What if we change that something that we consider fundamental to ourselves? Something we think, what, the way we think of the world. What if what changes is something that's a part of our identity that we hold close and dear? What do we do then? How do we handle that? And so let's take a look at someone who faced a lot of change. Jeremiah. And let's see what he did. So if you would turn to me with Jeremiah 1. And for the saying of this, if you remember, Jeremiah was a prophet during the times, is the last times of Judah and Jerusalem. This is when Israel had fallen and all that was left was Judah. Basically, everything had gone around but that one spot. And this is when he's talking about when people go into captivity. So Hebrew people had built their whole identity around Jerusalem, the temple, and Jeremiah, beyond that, he was the son of a priest. He was the son of a famous priest, Hilkiah. And so he especially had ties to Jerusalem and the temple. And let's read. In Jeremiah 1, 4 through 6, what he says. Here's what he first says when God changes things for him. His first reaction. Jeremiah 1, starting in verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Then said I, Ah, uh, Lord God? Behold, I cannot speak, for I'm but a youth. So this is God saying, hey, Jeremiah, you're going to go to be a prophet to the nations. Yes, all those nations that do not like you and do not want to hear what you have to tell them. Yeah, that's it. Go tell them what I say, and no, it will not make them happy. 
And Jeremiah's going, Lord, I'm a kid. I can't do that. Nope, 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 nope. Not me. Not me. Denial is the first step when you got the world yanked out from underneath you, right? Here he is going along thinking he's got his past set. He's all good. He knows what's going down in the future. And boom, he's sent off from left field, right? Most common reaction is basically, no, that can't be right. That can't be right. That, no, that didn't happen. But that's a common first step. But that's not the end of the story, right? We're in Jeremiah 1. Let's keep on going. And let's see what Jeremiah does. Now, first, he has a long listening session with God, about 11 chapters worth. So he listens a lot. But then let's turn over to chapter 11 and see what he actually does. Beyond his initial reaction of, wait a second, what does he do? In chapter 11, verse 1, in this scripture, the first part we're going to read is God speaking. But then at the very end, Jeremiah speaks. And then after the scripture, you're going to hear Jeremiah speaking for. But let's read Jeremiah 1 through 5. Jeremiah 11, 1 through 5. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Hear the words of this covenant, and speak to the men of Judah, and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and say to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Cursed is the man who does not obey the words of this covenant, which I commanded your fathers in the day I brought them out of the land of Egypt, from the iron furnace, saying, Obey my voice, and do according to all that I command you, so you shall be my people, and I will be your God, that I may establish the oath which I have sworn to your fathers, to give them a land flowing with milk and honey, as it is this day. And this is Jeremiah. And I said, so be it, Lord. Notice that. So be it, Lord. Jeremiah gets a long hard message and mission from God. And his response is, Amen. So be it. The next thing you know in those following verses, it's no longer God speaking, but Jeremiah basically off and going. He's delivering the message. And a little few verses later, his life is on the line for that. But he's off. He's going. Now, at first glance, it seems Jeremiah's world's upside down, right? He has to go to everyone news that they do not want to hear. But let's look at really what's happening. How much has this world turned upside down? So first, Jeremiah was the son of a priest, right? Well, if he's the son of a priest, if he followed that line and became a priest, what words would he be telling the people? God's words, right? He's got to preach. So that's, he already has to deliver God's word, God's message to people. The fundamentals of that part have not changed. What about Jerusalem? Well, God's temple was built. It's about to be taken away. Isn't that something new? Well, let's look back at the time and let's turn to Chronicles 1, 11. And let's see about Jerusalem. Does anybody remember what Jerusalem used to be called before it was Jerusalem? It's a town called Jebus. And in 1 Chronicles 11, we'll read about that. Turn with me to 1 Chronicles 11, please. First Chronicles 11. Starting in verse 4. And David and all Israel went to Jerusalem, which is Jebus, where the Jebusites were, the inhabitants of the land. But the inhabitants of Jebus said to David, You shall not come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is, the city of David. And this is how he did it. Verse 6. Now David said, Whoever attacks the Jebusites first, shall be chief and captain. And Joab, the son of Zeruiah, went up first and became chief. Then David dwelt in the stronghold. Therefore, they call it the city of David. That was somebody else's land, right? That was a town called Jebus, and now it's the city of David, Zion. Jerusalem was thought to be almost magical by the Judeans at the time. Everyone else had fallen except for that one town, that one area. It was special to them. How are they forgotten? And not that long ago, it was called Jebus, and it wasn't theirs. What made Jerusalem special? Nothing. God is special. But he's not just in Jerusalem, is he? There is nothing special about that particular area of land. 
However, the people worship God there, and God is special. Now let's look a little bit deeper. What about the temple that resided on that land? What about that fancy building coated in gold with all the carvings? It's beautiful. What about that place? Well, let's see. Let's go back and look at what God said about the temple when David wanted to build it. Stay in 1 Chronicles. Let's turn to chapter 17. 1 Chronicles 17, verse 1. First Chronicles 17, 1 Chronicles 17.1, it reads, Now it came to pass, when David was dwelling in his house, that David said to Nathan, the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of the covenant of the Lord is under tent curtains. Then David, Nathan said to David, Do all that's in your heart, for God is with you. But it happened that night, the word of God came to Nathan, saying, Go, tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, you shall not build me a house to dwell in, for I have not dwelt in a house since the time that I brought up Israel, even to this day. But I've gone from tent to tent, from one tabernacle to another. Wherever have I moved about with all Israel, have I ever spoken a word to any of the judges of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people, saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? You know, God's probably thinking, are you crazy? Don't you know better? I'm the, what makes you think the almighty God of the universe is going to be contained in a little bitty house or contained at all? He needs a house. The temple was for the people, right? It was a shiny building with all that gold and it was beautiful. But it was just that. It was only a building. Do we have a temple today to worship in? No. We have this building, but it's, you know, it's not the same. It's a building. But yet, do we need a fancy temple to worship in today? No, we don't. We worship God in everything we do and whatever we do, wherever we're at. Everything belongs to the Creator. We might as well recognize and worship Him wherever we're at. It's all His. So what changed for Jeremiah when the temple fell? What, what was the key there? It's only the address, right? He now has a different place. Jeremiah still worshiped God no matter where he was led or where he was taken or what happened to him. Even in Daniel, when you read Daniel, he's off in another land, and yet he's still worshiping God wherever he's at. What really changed was just the physical. God did not. And that's key. The concept of worshiping God never changed. And that's what matters. God. We've been back in the beginnings of things in the Old Testament. Let's change for a moment and go to the New Testament and take a look at Revelation 1. We've been toward the beginning. Let's go to the very end. If you would turn me to Revelation 1, verse 8. In Revelation 1, verse 8, this is God speaking to John. And you actually get to know a little bit about how God thinks in Revelation. It's kind of neat. It's complex. But Revelation 1, 8 actually holds a key to things. In Revelation 1, the very end of the Bible, verse 8 says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. God is saying that He's the start, the finish. He's been here. He is here. And He's always going to be here. As those world changes events happen, We've got one anchor, right? And only one anchor. And the verse we read today, Psalm 18, if you would turn to me to Psalm 18, that's the one that Brother Alex read earlier. Beautiful verse. David puts that very well. In Psalm 18, it reads, begin in verse 1. I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God my strength, in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. And that's the secret, right? When we see our worlds turned upside down, when we say to ourselves, whoa, that's new, that's different, 
What's going to happen now? We hold on to our anchor, which we know will never change. And we weather the storm, we move on, and we still hold on to that anchor afterwards, right? And now you're probably saying, we all know this. We're here, aren't we? This is old hat. I know Faze, you're thinking, we're something new. <laughs> well, we all survived the pandemic, which changed the whole world as we know it, right? A couple years ago, something happened that took everything out we, we thought about. And what did we do? Well, the building's not available. No worries. God's still available. Let's go in line. Like Jeremiah, off we went. We stayed strong and we came out better. We're going to have Wednesday night Bible study with a brother from the Philippines. We have family online today from the East Coast, from a wide range, geographic range. We have hundreds of unique viewers. And people are listening to hours of our videos every month online. We're reaching people we never thought we would. We're still a small congregation. But we can share the Lord with so many more souls now than we could in the past. We've got new avenues that have opened up to us. And who would have ever thought that would have come out of the pandemic? Even though it made us better, would we choose the pandemic to happen to us? No, absolutely not. That was horrible. Many persons lost so much over that time. But we held on to our anchor. We kept going and we came back. We're still here. We're still stronger. God works in ways that are higher than ours. But with him, we always make it through. We always reach the other side, and it'll always work out for our good. Now, here's a question that's a bit more challenging. God has pushed us to expand the reach out in ways we never expected to. Things have changed. Things are different. We've got new avenues. When things go back to the way they were, when the pandemic passes, we can come here. We can do things. Do we drop everything that we did, everything that we gained? Do we push it back? Do we go back to what's familiar and comfortable? We like the building. We know about local things. Should we forget to back off this and forget about how God's blessed us? And the Jewish person, they had a chance to do this. Their temple was rebuilt, albeit that was a dictator named Herod, but it was rebuilt. Let's see what they did. Let's read in Jeremiah what was prophesied about the temple. Going back to Jeremiah, if you would. Jeremiah 7, 1 through 15. This one's a long one, so bear with me on this one. If everybody would, turn to Jeremiah 7. We'll read it together. Jeremiah 7, 1 through 15. Again in verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house, and proclaim here, there this word. And say, hear the word of the Lord, all you of Judah, who enter in these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doing, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Do not trust in these lying words, saying, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. For if you thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if you thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if you do not oppress the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, do not shed innocent blood in this place or walk after other gods to your hurt. Then I will cause you to dwell in this place in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. Behold, you trust in lying words and cannot profit. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal, and walk after other gods whom you do not know? And then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered due to all these abominations. Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of thieves in your eyes? Behold, I, even I have seen it, says the Lord. But go now to my place, which was in Shiloh, where I set my name at first, and see what I did to it because of the wickedness, wickedness of my people Israel. And now, because you have done all these works, says the Lord, and I spoke to you rising up early and speaking, but you did not hear. And I called you, but you did not answer. Therefore. I will do to the house which is called by my name and which you trust and do this place which I gave to you and your fathers as I have done in Shiloh and I will cast you out of my sight as I've cast out all your brethren, the whole posterity of Ephraim. 
The people cried out for the building, the temple of the Lord of these things. But it was God whom they should have been crying out for, right? They lost their way. They lost what they were doing. God tells them plainly, putting his name on some place, only part of the equation. And that's not what they, uh, matters at all. The people, their actions, their dedication, their relationship to God, that's what's important. Not the location. This is why in the New Testament, early Christians worshipped in houses, in markets, in schools, anywhere they could, at any time they could. And it wasn't just one day of the week. Their worship was part of their daily lives, their daily walk with God, and it was very important to them. Now let's turn to the New Testament and see what God in human form Jesus says. Let's turn to Matthew 12. Matthew 12, beginning in verse 6. Matthew 12 and 6 says, Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even on the Sabbath. And this is basically saying, Jesus saying, there's something more here than the temple. Something more important than that. He was there. God incarnate in human form. God is greater than any location, any physical thing, or any traditions that we have. God's what matters. Anywhere we are, all throughout our lives, we're to worship Him. We come together on Sunday mornings and take part of the Lord's Supper. As close as we can get to His time of resurrection. How often we often forget? Does anybody remember when that passage that we read so often on Sundays actually instituted the Lord's Supper? And what day of the week that was? That was actually on the Thursday night in the upstairs guest room of a stranger's house. Let's turn to Luke 22, 7 through 20. Luke 22, 7 through 20. Then the day of the unleavened bread, when Passover must be killed, and he sent Peter, and this is Jesus speaking, and he sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat. So they said to him, where do you want us to prepare? And he said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house which he enters. Then you shall say to the master of the house, The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large furnished upper room. There, make ready. So they went and found it just as he had said to them, and they prepared the Passover. When the hour had come, he sat down, and twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them, Fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not, eat the, I will not drink the fruit of the vine until the kingdom comes. And he took the bread gave thanks, and broke it, and gave to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. That's that most important ceremony that we do here every Sunday, the Lord's Supper. This is Thursday evening, before Jesus was taken for a sham trial in the night, killed on the cross on Friday, and then glorious resurrection on, for us all on Sunday morning. The time up to Sunday morning is not pleasant at all. If you study that time, there's betrayal, there's torture, there's lies, and there's finally death and grieving. It is brutal. However, Sunday morning, Sunday morning is glorious. That's when he came back. That's the point when he came back and was resurrected. And that's when we got salvation. The moment of history, all of history, led up to that moment. And that is awesome and powerful. And that is where the practice of us coming together on Sunday morning came. This is as close to the time that we can get to when he was resurrected. That's why the first New Testament Christians did it. Those early ones. This is what we celebrate. This is the power. The rest of it is not so pretty. He had to go through it. But when he came back that Sunday morning, ah, that's awesome. And that's why we come together on Sunday mornings. 
That's why we're here. And that's the part we want to remember. That's the part of the story to celebrate. That's why we practice meeting on Sunday mornings. That's why they started that. Now, going back to the question asked earlier, do we try to recreate things exactly as they were before the pandemic? No. Why would we? Kind of showing us a better way. He's seen his new doors for us. We need to listen to God. Take fullest advantage of any avenue he gave us to reach souls. Serve him in any way we can. Let's never be the ones to revert back and close the doors that God's given us and open to us. Now about those ways that God's given us. They stop on Sunday morning. We come here for the glorious remember of his resurrection. But is this all there is to it? Does it end at 12 o'clock when we close the prayer and the last thing, do we walk out the door and say, yep, I've done for my week? No, right? We all know that. It goes on. This is just a recharge station. This is just a time to come together. We come together to focus on God. We've got ministries that we've not had in the past. We're reaching out to the community. We're volunteering to help those in needs. We're collecting stuff to give to the homeless in the community. We're going to nursing homes. We're, we're helping the homeless community. We're doing things that we should be doing as a church, as a family. Those song practices we had last Sunday, the brother Mike, wonderful practice he gave us. The instructions, there's two things to that. One, we're going to get better every Sunday when we come here and we sing, and we can do better and better. But there's also another thing that we can do. There's a worship of singing to other people, going to nursing homes, going to people's houses, the people that are sick. That is a very, very important thing. So not only can we be better here, but the might be helping us out being better in our ministries to others too. The things we do aren't just on Sunday morning. Now, are any of those ministries not Sunday morning activities? Should we do any of them on Sunday? Well, you meet somebody in need, yes. But otherwise, they occur all throughout the week, right? Let's turn to James 1. James 1, verse 27. Many of you may already know this. James 1, 27. James 1, 27 reads, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. There's a lot more than just Sunday mornings, right? This is important. This is very important, but there's more to it. As you're going to turn over to James 2 while we're here. James 2, verse 14. And let's read a little bit more. James 2, verse 14. What is the prophet, my brethren? If someone says he has faith but does not have works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to him, Depart in peace, be warm and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But you do, do you want to know, oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Our time here, spent with family, worshiping God is important. It is. But it cannot stop here. When we leave this building, it's just the beginning. This is our recharge to go out for the week. Our worship must be going on Sunday to all of our lives. God worked six days. Remember the Genesis? God worked six days and took a break on the seventh. And a lot of people flip that. They think one day is our work and the rest is rest from God, right? So many people do that. The trick is we're to work for God all the days. And that seventh wasn't for rest, really. The reason he instituted the Sabbath was basically to come and to focus on God and worship him. We can come together as a family. And that's important. There's a time to recharge before we go back at it. God asks us to be fellow workers and fellow laborers, not spectators. And so many of you know that, and I'm so thankful to have this family here. I'm so proud to be a member of this part of this group because there's so many of that. This is old hat, and you know this, and I love you all for that, and I thank you. 
That's a wonderful part about being part of God's family. In a sports game, you got people in the stands. Remember last week, the big Super Bowl? You got that stand filled with spectators. And you got that small group on the field working. But God never meant for his family to be like that, right? We're all supposed to be in the stands working. And there's so many of you that are. Thank you. God gave us an example in Jesus. You came to earth. earth. He worked hard. He gave it all. It's only right that we try to return a portion of that blessings that he's given us. There's also a very important step for those that are thinking about it. We give ourselves back. We come up and we say, I want to be baptized. I want to join God's family. This is something really good. And we decide to take that step. And whether it's today or any day, it's always a good step to take. And as our tradition, we always include an invitation for anybody who wants to do that. We've got water. Thanks to Charles and the others who have been working on it. It's actually nice and clean now. It's real looking good. We've always got a convenient spot at the time of the message to offer an invitation. But even if it's not today, it's throughout the week, whenever it is, whenever you've studied enough and you've made that decision to go, there's always water available. God is always ready for you to take that decision. And having the God who was, who is, who will always be our rock, and our salvation is the only thing that matters. No matter what comes, we've seen it. We've done that. If you're ready, come forward and let us know you want to be baptized. If there's anything else, any prayers or any need you need of the congregation, please come as we sing the invitation song. Thank you.